Greetings, and on behalf of the Lumen Christi Institute, I'd like to welcome you to this third installation of our spring webinar lecture series on reason and faith in medieval Christian thought. My name is Michael LeChevalier, and I'm Associate Director of the Lumen Christi Institute. Uh, before turning it over to Rob, our moderator for tonight, I'd like to call your attention to next week's special events. If, as I would imagine you are for tuning in here today, you are a fan of Aquinas, I'd like to invite you back next Tuesday. We'll be joined by Stephen Meredith, professor in the Department of Pathology, Neurology, and Biochemistry and Molecular, Molecular Biology at the University of Chicago, where he also teaches courses on literature, philosophy, and theology. He'll be joined in conversation um, by Jeffrey Bishop, professor of philosophy and professor of theology at St. Louis University, where they'll be joining us here together next week, Tuesday, at 5 p.m. for a discussion on disease and the problem of evil. Um, next week, we'll also continue this series with Barbara Newman, a real giant in the field of medieval studies for a lecture on Hildegard of Bingham uh, right here at 7 p.m. next week, Thursday. Uh, you can find out more details at our website. I want to thank uh, our co-sponsors for tonight, uh, the Calvert House Catholic Center, the Collegium Institute, the Harvard Catholic Center, the Nova Forum, the St. Benedict Institute, and the St. Paul's University Catholic Center. Um, all of these uh, programs are playing an important role in helping make the Catholic intellectual tradition a live option at secular campuses. I'm also grateful to our donors who help make this work possible. If you want to support our work, you can donate at www.lumenchristi.org slash donate. A gift of any amount is helpful in putting these events on and supporting our work at the University of Chicago. I'll now hand the event over to Rob Porval, a recent PhD graduate from the University of Chicago who also works to help our plan our undergraduate programming and who has helped organize this series. Um, Rob, take it away. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. We're starting another installment of this in the series Reason and Wisdom in Medieval Christian Thought. The series offers a series of introductions to great thinkers and, uh, and, and ideas in medieval Christian thinking, uh, especially with regard to the tension between a contemplative and, uh, and more dialectical ways of seeking the face of God. As Michael mentioned, our upcoming uh, presentation next week will be uh, by Professor Barbara Newman on Hildegard of Bingen, Doctor of the Church, after that, Peter Abelard and Bernard of Clairvaux, Julian of Norwich, uh, Nicholas of Cusa, and Meister Eckhart are also on the list. Anytime during the presentation, uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And anytime during the presentation, you can uh, ask a question. At the end of the presentation, we'll have a moderated Q&A in which we'll ask these our questions to Dr. Carl. Uh, Dr. Dr. Brian Carl, who will be giving our presentation tonight, teaches philosophy and theology and the Center of Thomistic uh, Studies at, and at large at the University of St. Thomas in Houston, Texas. He specializes in the thought of St. Thomas and on topics such as virtue ethics, metaphysics, and Thomas Aquinas' understanding of the divine names. For that reason, we're delighted to host Dr. Carl to speak with us tonight on St. Thomas Aquinas on the ways to know God. Dr. Carl, I'd like to uh, invite you to turn on your camera to unmute yourself. And I'll turn the, the floor over to you. Okay. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, let me begin just by offering my thanks to the Lumen Christi Institute uh, for the invitation to speak. Um, and thank you to all of you who are uh, joining us this evening. Uh, it's very big, very good to be with you. Um, I'm going to be speaking tonight fundamentally about faith and reason as the ways in which human beings in this life are able to know God, as these ways are understood by the 13th century Dominican St. Thomas Aquinas. Now, I'm by training a philosopher rather than a theologian. A lot of my own research has concerned St. Thomas's philosophical theology, that is, his reasoning concerning the existence and the attributes of God. Uh, but there is going to be quite a bit of theological content in this talk uh, for a very simple reason. To explain what St. Thomas thinks about the ways in which human beings can know God in this life, 
and to talk about the role that philosophical reasoning might play in the effort to know God, we have to situate anything that we say about St. Thomas's account of philosophical reasoning about God within the context of the wider range of ways in which he thinks that God can be known, particularly those ways possible only through grace and faith. So I'm going to begin uh, just with a little bit of um, introductory biography of St. Thomas for anyone who's not already familiar with the man, a little bit about his context in the 13th century and about theology in the 13th century, um, and then I'll move on really to the, the main content of my presentation. Um, hopefully everyone is able to see the slides. Okay. All right. So Thomas Aquinas was born in 1225 in Rocca Secca, Italy. He was born into a noble family. Um, at a very young age, he was sent to live as an oblate at the Benedictine monastery, the famous monastery at Monte Cassino. Um, it's often been thought that uh, Thomas's family might have hoped for Thomas to one day become the abbot of Monte Cassino, which is a very uh, powerful and significant uh, position in uh, 13th century Italy. Thomas was sent for studies um, at the age of 14 or so. Um, he went to study liberal arts at the University of Naples. And that's a significant fact in part because at this time in the 12, uh, late 1230s, early 1240s, the reading of the philosophical works of Aristotle was somewhat limited at other universities, especially at the University of Paris, uh, but was not restricted at uh, the University of Naples. And so Thomas had more opportunity from a young age to be exposed to some of the new philosophical sources that were entering into Latin translation at this time in the 13th century. Now, contrary very much to his uh, family's wishes uh, for his life, they, they wanted him to be um, a priest, wanted him to be a monk, but certainly did not want him to be a Dominican to join up with the, this ragtag group, this new group of mendicant uh, friars. But uh, Thomas encountered Dominicans who had a priory in Naples. And in 1244, he decided to take the Dominican habit. Uh, he was uh, detained by his family for some time, put under kind of house arrest um, before being able to, uh, to rejoin the Dominicans. For a time, he was a student of St. Albert the Great, Albertus Magnus, and then went on to do his own theological studies at the University of Paris, where he became a master of theology. Uh, he spent the rest of his life um, as a, a master, a teacher of theology, first in Paris, then in a series of places in his native Italy, and then again in Paris. And then towards the end of his life, he returned to Italy and he died in 1274 in Fosanova. Uh, I won't read through these, but uh, just major works of St. Thomas Aquinas for those uh, who aren't aware. Um, now, Thomas's works in the critical edition that's still being edited by the Leonine Commission occupies uh, 50 volumes, 50 planned volumes. Uh, so this is just some of the highlights of uh, uh, just the tremendous uh, output that he had as a, a theological and philosophical author. Uh, certainly the most famous of St. Thomas' works is the Summa Theologiae, this great comprehensive, albeit unfinished, treatise on uh, Catholic theology. And I'll mention some of the contents of the Summa Theologiae a little later in the presentation. All right. To begin properly speaking, we need to say something about the context first of mid-13th century Catholic theology. The office of a theologian in the 13th century, the work of a theologian focused on three tasks, legere, disputare, and predicare. First, legere, the reading of and commentary upon texts, particularly upon the sacred scriptures. Predicare, the preaching of sermons, formal university sermons. And disputare, determining the answers to theological difficulties and questions in both private classroom disputations and in formal public disputations. The questions, the dubitationes, addressed by these formal theological disputations were frequently sourced and motivated by the tension or apparent contradiction between the assertions of different authorities, autoritates. These included the scriptures, the writings of the fathers and doctors, early councils, as well as philosophical sources, including many philosophical sources that were introduced for the first time into Latin in the late 12th 
uh, in the late 12th and early 13th centuries. The introduction of these new sources of Aristotle, of uh, Neoplatonic sources like Proclus, of Arabic authors and philosophy like Avicenna and Averroes, the introduction of these writings um, complicated in a tremendous way the work of theology engaging with sources and solving disputes that arise from sources, from authorities. These new philosophical sources offered, we can say at the same time, both new resources for the work of theology as faith seeking understanding, but also new challenges because the philosophical authorities of pagan Greek and Islamic authors frequently contradicted or seemed to contradict the contents of Christian revelation. To take one most famous case, Aristotle purports to prove by philosophical reasoning in his physics that the physical cosmos is eternal, that the world has always existed and always will exist, uh, contradicting the very first line of scripture that in the beginning God created. Uh, Aristotle was also taken by many interpreters in the 13th century to deny the immortality of the human soul, which would obviously be a problem for Catholic faith. And so there arose at the universities some radical followers of Aristotle, particularly not in the theology faculties, but in the arts faculties where philosophical sources were treated more directly. There arose in the arts faculties, especially at the University of Paris, radical followers of Aristotle who accepted his positions um, these controversial positions that contradicted the contents of, of the Catholic faith. And so for these reasons, the question of the relationship between faith and reason was an especially pressing one in the, in the mid 13th century. And this is the context in which St. Thomas is living, studying and writing. All right. Like other teachers of the Catholic faith, St. Thomas routinely refers to those in the present life as viatores, wayfarers, those who are on the way. As creatures, we come from God. God is our first cause. We are ordered to return to God as our final, as our final end, as our ultimate purpose. As intellectual creatures, we're ordered towards intellectual union with God in the beatific vision when we will see him as he is, see him face to face. So St. Thomas's understanding of the relationship between reason and faith is grounded most fundamentally in his insistence upon the distinction between nature and grace. Our nature is what we are as creatures made by God. Our nature is the source of our natural activities, the activities that we are capable of performing just in so far as we are the kind of beings that we are. And following Aristotle for St. Thomas, our capacity to reason is our distinctive capacity as human beings. By grace, God elevates our natures um, assists and elevates and transforms our natural capacities, enabling us to do things that are beyond our unassisted natural power. So knowing truths about the mysteries of God with the certitude of divinely given faith is an example of such an act. There is perhaps no more important expression in Thomas's writings for understanding the foundation of his account of the relationship between faith and reason, then his assertion found at the very beginning of the Summa Theologiae, but repeating almost verbatim, something that he had written um, in a very early writing on the same topic. He tells us that, quote, grace does not destroy nature, but perfects it. And this is in the context of explaining why it is that philosophical arguments, philosophical wisdom needs to be taken up into the work of theology of faith seeking understanding. I wanna situate Thomas's account of reason and faith, philosophical wisdom associated with reason and the knowledge of faith uh, 
I want to situate these within the wider context of a wider range of ways that Thomas thinks of as the ways that we come to know God in this life. And we can distinguish um, both several different ways in which we come to the knowledge of God by grace and several ways in which Thomas thinks our natural capacity is ordered towards the knowledge of God. So first, um, among the kinds of knowing God that are possible only by the elevation of grace, Thomas distinguishes first by the light of glory that we are capable of enjoying the beatific vision seeing God in his essence, seeing God face to face. Second, by the gifts of the Holy Spirit, in particular knowledge, understanding, and wisdom, we are capable of knowing God and knowing the things of God um, in a way that goes beyond even just what faith confers. And it's important that the gifts of the Holy Spirit for Thomas are something present in all those with sanctifying grace. And third, a kind of knowing God that's dependent upon grace is faith, the infused supernatural virtue that's given to the human mind by which we can know with certainty revealed truths about God. All of these are to be distinguished from ways of knowing God possible for our natural capacities. So first, um, Thomas in some text talks about the way of knowing God naturally that would have been possible for Adam and Eve before the fall. That Adam and Eve would have been able to see God as in a mirror, just in creation, without any need for discursive reasoning, without any need for demonstrations and arguments and resolving things to principles. Um, the work of philosophy, Adam and Eve would have just known the existence of God they would have seen God as in a mirror in knowing created things. But Thomas thinks that this way of knowing God clearly as in a mirror, in distinction from knowing dimly in a mirror, um, is something no longer available to the fallen human intellect. And so he thinks of the, the highest and the best that the human intellect can do is knowing God by philosophical wisdom, by demonstrative certain knowledge about the existence and attributes of God known as the first cause of all other things. We can arrive at such a knowledge of God by reasoning discursively from God's effect. But it is important that Thomas thinks that only few human beings in fact achieve, strictly speaking, philosophical knowledge concerning God's existence and attributes. Um, and even in some places, he'll insist that for a variety of reasons, um, only relatively few human beings can. One of the reasons he gives is just that it takes a lot of time uh, to, to master philosophy. Uh, third, we should distinguish knowing about God's existence by probable or persuasive reasoning. Again, reasoning from the world. Okay? Thomas does in a few places talk about a knowledge of God's existence that is common to most human beings, right? And I think we could think in connection with this of things like design arguments, right? If it just makes sense to people that, you know, there's all this order in the world, right? Surely there's a mind, right? Responsible for the world. That's not a, a de Thomas wouldn't think of that as a strict philosophical demonstration, but that's not to say that it's a, an argument to be entirely dismissed. It's just not, it doesn't rise to the level of philosophical demonstration. Okay. I'm going to focus in what follows, as I've said, on faith and reason, okay? The knowledge of God through faith and the knowledge of God through philosophical reasoning. Um, but I want to place them again in the context of this wider range of ways in which God is known. Corresponding to the distinction between faith and reason Thomas draws an importantly, a tremendously important distinction between what he calls the mysteries of faith and what he calls the preambles of faith. So the mysteries of faith are those truths about God that can be only known in and through divine revelation. They're known with certitude from the infused faith that's a gift from God. Okay. Thomas's examples of such truths that are mysteries of faith consistently are the Trinity and the Incarnation. Um, in contrast to many of his contemporaries in the 13th century, Thomas always insists 
it's not by philosophical reasoning or philosophical demonstration that we could arrive at a knowledge of the Trinity. It's only by revelation, it's only by faith that we can know about the triune uh, character of God. The mysteries of faith can be distinguished from what Thomas calls the preambles of faith. Preambles of faith are truths about God that can be known with certainty by philosophical reasoning, but truths that are apart from such philosophical demonstration, otherwise truths that would be known by faith. Okay, so if one doesn't know how to demonstrate that God exists, then one will believe by faith that God exists. If one doesn't know how to demonstrate that God is intelligent, then one will believe by faith that God is intelligent. Now, Thomas, when he gives examples of preambles of faith, will usually give the existence of God and the unity of God. So monotheism as his example of a preamble of faith. Um, but arguably, Thomas would intend to include under this heading of preambles of faith all of the other attributes of God that he treats in the first 26 questions of the Summa Theologiae. I won't read all of them here, but they're present on the bottom of the slide, and we'll see this list again in a moment. Concerning the relationship between faith and reason, we have to think about the relationship between theology and philosophy. And when commenting directly on this issue and raising the question of whether the work of theology should involve the arguments of philosophers or philosophical arguments appealing to naturally known principles, is there room for such arguments in the work of theology? In explaining his affirmative answer to this question, Thomas distinguishes three roles that philosophical reasoning and argumentation should play in the work of theology. First, because there are some truths pertaining to faith that can be demonstrated by philosophical reasoning, it pertains to the theologian to employ such philosophical arguments. And again, these truths are called the preambles of faith. But second, the theologian can use the reasoning and arguments of philosophy to make better known through likenesses found in creatures, the mysteries of faith, those truths that can only be known by revelation and faith. And so St. Thomas in this particular text points to St. Augustine's use of various created likenesses in his account of the Trinity. Third, Thomas says the theologian must resist those who argue against the faith, either by showing that their statements are false, or at least that their statements are not necessarily true. That is, that the arguments for their conclusions are not successful. And it's important to emphasize that for Thomas, the theologian responding to philosophical arguments against the faith must meet those errant philosophical objections on philosophical grounds. When the theologian doesn't respond to the errors of a philosopher only on the grounds of revelation, only on the grounds of what faith holds, but by philosophical and scientific reasoning. Now, we're going to be focusing in what, uh, going forward, on certain preambles of faith, the knowledge of God possible through philosophical reasoning. Speaking of ways of knowing God, of course, one of the things that will come to mind for anyone who has some familiarity with Thomas's thought will be the famous five ways of the Summa Theologiae. So I've listed here um, just an outline, very quick outline of Thomas's five ways of proving God's existence. The common feature that all five ways have is that they begin with some feature of the world as known to us through sense experience and then argues for the need for a transcendent cause, a superior first cause, in order to explain that feature of the world. So for example, the argument from motion concludes that there must exist a first unmoved mover. The argument from orders among efficient causality concludes there must be a first uncaused efficient cause, and so on. All of St. Thomas's later philosophical proofs about God, his proofs of God's simplicity, perfection, goodness, infinity, and so on. All that he goes on to attempt to prove philosophically about the divine nature is grounded in 
his initial identification of God as the first uncaused efficient cause. Everything that happens in the first 26 questions of the Symmetria Logiae, in order to count as philosophical demonstrations, well, it has, they have to be grounded in what Thomas has initially shown in his argumentation for God's existence. Okay. Now, having quickly um, referenced the five ways, the notion that for Thomas, we reason from effects to God as the cause, um, Often with Thomas's philosophical theology, I think it strikes pe people have the concern that there's something overly rationalistic about uh, Thomas's account of, of God in the Summa Theologiae. And one of the very first things that has to be said, I think, to counteract this is to note how significant the limitations of philosophical reasoning are when it comes to reasoning about God on St. Thomas's view. So on the one hand, it's true. St. Thomas does find among the arguments of the philosophers, the philosophical sources that he encounters in the 13th century, he does find in them arguments that he regards as proving demonstratively that God exists, that God is one, that God is intelligent, and so on. Arguments that he adopts from Aristotle, Avicenna, Maimonides, Proclus, Augustine, Anselm, and so on. But St. Thomas also adopts, and in this case primarily from Aristotle, reasons why the human mind is unable by its natural power to arrive at any properly scientific knowledge of the essence of God. Knowledge of the essence of God is for St. Thomas the beatific vision. Okay? It is only the vision of the divine essence given to those in the life to come. The sort of knowledge that we achieve concerning the essences of sensible material beings, Thomas thinks we do know what things are. We understand the essences of things when it comes to the things that we know through the senses. The sort of knowledge that we have concerning created sensible things, knowing what they are, understanding their essences, we cannot achieve that sort of knowledge concerning the divine essence in this life. And so St. Thomas will consistently insist, we know that God exists, we know that God is wise, and so on, but we cannot grasp directly what God is, what the divine wisdom is, and so on. Another set of ways that come to mind immediately when thinking about the ways in which God is known, um, Thomas adopts from Pseudo-Dionysius what he, St. Thomas, calls the triplex via, the threefold way. Three ways in which the human mind is related to God as this superior cause who is beyond our ability to grasp him. The three ways of the threefold way are causality, negation, and eminence. So first, associated with the way of causality, first, the fact that we can only know God as a cause by reasoning from things that are his effects, reasoning back to the existence and the characteristics of the cause. We also know God precisely as the cause of perfections that are found in creatures. We can know nothing about God by philosophical reasoning except by first knowing him as the cause of certain perfections that we know in creatures. So for example, we call God wise in part just because he is the cause of wisdom. He is the ultimate source of wisdom right, for human beings that have wisdom. But the way of causality has to be tempered immediately by the way of negation. We are unable to know God as he is in himself. And so we know God and his attributes by negatively distinguishing God from creatures. And when we say that God is wise, even when we affirm that, we recognize that God is not wise as a creature is wise. When we say that God is a being, we recognize God is not a being as a creature is a being, and so on. Whatever is affirmed of God causally can also be denied of God if we would attempt to predicate any perfection found in creatures univocally of God. 
But causality and negation alone aren't enough, Thomas thinks, to explain the way in which we know God in this life or to explain the significance and the meaning of language and thought about God. So the third way that he finds in Dionysius is the way of eminence. The starting point for the way of eminence is recognizing that we don't deny things of God because he is less than creatures or because he lacks anything that is found in creatures. Rather, when we deny that God is wise as a creature is wise, or when we deny that God is a being in the way that creatures are beings, we do so because God infinitely exceeds every creature in his unlimited perfection. And so we also then understand that the perfections that are attributed to God, such as being and wisdom and goodness, must pre-exist in God in a supereminent higher mode. In fact, they are all identical with God himself. God is being itself, God is wisdom itself, God is goodness itself, and so on. All of these perfections as found in creatures are various imperfect likenesses of the divine perfection. All right, taking what we've uh, looked at so far, um, I won't read through this, this whole text, um, uh, the whole thing. I'm just going to point to a couple of things in it. Romans 120 is the text that St. Thomas cites as a scriptural authority when he raises the question in the Summa Theologiae of whether God's existence can be demonstrated. And he appeals to the authority of Romans 120 that the invisible things of God are known, right, from the things in the world, okay? And I just want to point to Thomas's commentary on this text and note the way in which he integrates the threefold way of Dionysius while also acknowledging that we do not in any case come to a knowledge of what God is in himself in this life, but we know God as the cause, we know him as this exceeding and more imminent cause, and we distinguish him from creatures by denying everything that he is not. Okay. And then a little bit later in the commentary on Romans 120, I want to focus on this claim in particular. Uh, St. Paul says that the invisible things of God are known, okay, from the things that are made. And Thomas says the following, quote, Paul says invisible things using the plural because God's essence is not known to us in regard to what it is, that is, as it is in itself one. That is the way it will be known in heaven. And here he quotes uh, the book of Zechariah. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. But it is now manifested to us through certain likenesses found in creatures, which participate in manifold ways in that which is one in God. Accordingly, our intellect considers the unity of the divine essence under the aspects of goodness, wisdom, power, and so on, all of which are one in God. Therefore, Paul calls these the invisible things of God because the one reality in God which corresponds to these names or notions is not seen by us so that what is seen was made out of things which do not appear. Okay, um, having talked a little bit about the relationship between faith and reason, having talked a little bit about the idea of philosophical reasoning arriving at this knowledge of the existence and the attributes of God, all of that substituting, as it were, in a very imperfect way for the unified vision of the divine essence hoped for in the life to come. I want to just look quickly at the way in which Thomas's account of the role of philosophical knowledge within theology has some implications, both in his Trinitarian theology and in his Christology. So first, concerning Trinitarian theology. St. Thomas adopts from Pseudo-Dionysius the claim that those truths pertaining to God as the cause, those names, those names of God taken from perfections that flow into creatures from God as their creative cause. Again, names like being and goodness and wisdom and power and so on. 
All of those names are also names pertaining to the divine essence or nature, the essence or nature that is common to the three Trinitarian persons. So divine knowledge, divine will, divine power, those attributes in virtue of which God is the cause, the creator of creatures, these are in reality identical with the hidden invisible divine essence. The divine creative action is common to the persons. Now, St. Thomas differs from what he finds in Pseudo Dionysius, however, because whereas Pseudo Dionysius only asserts scriptural authority for these causal divine names that pertain to the divine essence rather than to one person in particular, St. Thomas also supplies philosophical arguments adopted or developed from other sources like Aristotle and Avicenna, reasoning from effects found in the, in the created world to a knowledge of God as the cause. So all of this is to say that the distinction between the unitive theology, the theology about the divine essence and discrete theology or the theology about the divine persons is grounded in the distinction between the creative procession of creatures from God and the procession within God of the, the persons of the Trinity. Okay. So it's for a very deep reason, right? That Thomas in the first 26 questions of the Summa Theologiae concerning the divine essence sticks to philosophical arguments reasoning from created effects. All right, the second application I would point towards is in St. Thomas's Christology. So first, just a couple of very basic points about um, Thomistic Christology. If Jesus Christ is one divine person who is both fully God and fully man, if he has divine nature and human nature, then philosophical knowledge about the divine nature and philosophical knowledge about human nature are going to be, along with Trinitarian theology, prerequisites for the work of Christology. And so St. Thomas's philosophically grounded views about the divine nature represented in the first 26 questions of the Summa and his adoption of a fundamentally Aristotelian view about human nature, a view about human nature where we understand the soul and the body in terms of form and matter, where we distinguish the various powers of the soul, the faculties of the human soul, where we distinguish the various virtues corresponding to those powers and so on. That full account of human nature factors into, enters into Thomas's Christology. But perhaps one of the most important things to say about how St. Thomas thinks about Christ and Christ especially in his earthly life is that Christ was simul viator et comprehensor at once both a viator, both a wayfarer, but also one comprehending, okay? Going back to the beginning of the talk, we are wayfarers ordered towards the knowledge of God and the beatific vision. Christ in his earthly life for St. Thomas already possessed the beatific vision. Um, and in fact, already possessed both the beatific vision and as perfect and complete a fulfillment of his natural capacities for knowledge as a human being can possess. So St. Thomas holds that in his earthly life, Christ in his human intellect enjoyed the beatific vision of the divine essence, an infused habitual knowledge of all things, including all sciences, and in addition, an experiential or acquired knowledge based on his own sense experience. The reason that I bring this up is this. Christ, on St. Thomas's view, already possessed in his earthly life, in his human nature, all of the perfections and knowledge towards which Christ is the way for other human beings. And so Thomas's way of thinking about the relationship between theology and philosophy, between faith and reason, Theology is not to set aside philosophy, but is to make use of the best arguments in philosophy, is to integrate the achievements of human reason, the fulfillment of our natural capacity for reasoning into a life that's been elevated by grace, that's been illuminated by faith, okay? What the theologian does is a sort of 
itself an imperfect imitation, right, of the perfect knowledge possessed by Christ in his earthly life, okay, in which all of these ways of knowing God um, are totally fulfilled in Christ, the second person of the Trinity. All right, I'm not going to read through. This is what I'll leave you with uh, before we start the Q&A, uh, but I just want to point towards uh, Thomas's uh, commentary on the Gospel of John on, uh, book, uh, on chapter 14, verse 6. Uh, just because I think if we ask St. Thomas himself, the man directly, um, what is the way to know God? Certainly the first thing that would come to mind is Christ's assertion that he is the way. And I find Thomas's reflection on, on this passage from John um, especially uh, beautiful. Um, I'm not going to read through this. I've, I've bolded some things to call attention to them for you. Um, uh, picking up on some of the themes that I discussed earlier in the talk. I would only um, note that Thomas says that it is with respect to his human nature that Christ is the way and that as God, he is the truth and the life. And so, Tom, and so on Thomas's reading, he's echoing Augustine here in his commentary. Christ is telling us that he is both the way and the destination. He's the destination, right? Because he is God. Okay. Um, all right. With that, uh, I thank you and uh, look forward to your questions. Okay. Let's see. Thank you, Dr. Carl. That was a very robust, very, very, uh, very meaty presentation. We appreciate it very much. The, the, uh, the presentation you gave us was very much focused on this question of faith and reason and how they relate together. And so several of our questions are, are focused on these type of, these type of issues. Um, yeah, so uh, there, yeah, there's several. Uh, let, me, let me find one to get started here uh, with. Uh, uh, the first one has to do with uh, Thomas's reliance on, um, on knowledge of, of creation and uh, philosophical knowledge, but knowledge of material things. Uh, Kenneth Howell asks about, about that and the, um, uh, the fact that that kind of knowledge is always limited. It's always incomplete. Uh, Kenneth asks, since Thomas believes that we can have true knowledge of material creatures, how does he explain the fact that our knowledge of the material universe is always partial? That is, there's always more to know. Uh, thank you. That's a really excellent question um, and really picks at an important point, right, that I moved through very quickly. This whole idea that everything that we might reason to concerning the existence and attributes of God has to be founded in our knowledge of the things that we know through the senses. And that if Thomas is going to make this contrast between knowing what creatures are, something that he thinks we successfully do that, but on the other hand, we don't know what God is in himself. We know him at a sort of much greater intellectual distance. Well, that does depend upon this claim that we do, in fact, successfully know uh, material creatures. In fact, Thomas's own views on our knowledge of material creatures um, rather complicated and nuanced. So uh, Thomas, to give a very quick answer, thinks when we understand what a created sensible reality is, we know its definition, we understand it in terms of a genus and a difference. Um, he takes that account of what it is to know what something is from Aristotle and, uh, and from, uh, from Porphyry. Hmm. Um, but then Thomas, in a few places, expresses, uh, we could say, significant skepticism about our ability to actually know the differences of material things broadly. The one example that Thomas will consistently give of our understanding what something is, is in our self-knowledge. Mm -hmm. So it, Thomas, I think, will leave a lot of room for saying there are significant limitations in our understanding of the material universe, but he, he does elevate in privilege the way in which we're capable of understanding human nature, um, because we have, as it were, inside, you know, inside access. Um, so no, that is a really great question. Um, and you do have to build room for the limitations in our knowledge of created things into this account where however good our knowledge of created things is, 
right? Something he thinks we do achieve concerning created sensible things, we don't achieve concerning right realities higher than ourselves hmm. in this life. Hmm. Yeah, great question. Thank you. That's really helpful. And if I could press you, perhaps, on the same kind of topic, uh, someone else asked a question along these same lines, but also um, uh, brought out the question, the fact that not, not only is limitation, but also uh, maybe aberration. Uh, the question reads this, um, while many of us can and will affirm that philosophy can help make distinction in, distinctions in theology and the truths of the faith, how does one relate the two in such a way that man's reasonings, which are limited and often, and often faulty due to that limitation and sin's influence, mm -hmm. so that it does not create aberrations in our faith? Yeah, which, uh, yeah, this becomes a big question in the 16th century, of course, with the reformers and the suspicion that Aristotle has led us astray. Yeah, how would Thomas answer a question like this? Yeah, no, that is an excellent question. Um, uh, I'm trying to think. That's a big question. Yeah, it's just such a, it's such a very big question, right? Because the concern is about um, when we might be led astray by philosophical reasoning. Yeah, and I think I mean in Thomas's work as a as a theologian, um, uh, certainly the case right that the truths of the faith right uh, the truths taught by the church right um, do establish as it were um, boundaries right limits within right he looks for philosophical reasons and philosophical arguments. But then there's a legitimate question that's raised by that, right? And one way of, of posing the difficulty about, right, the relationship between theology and philosophy is to ask whether one who is a theologian or whether one who is committed by faith, right, to a certain mm. set of conclusions can really truly freely be a philosopher, do philosophy, right? Um, because if you have this concern that, well, philosophical reasoning could easily, you know, be aberrant relative to the, the content of faith. Um, I, Thomas's own view, he is committed to the claim that faith and reason are both themselves gifts of God. And so it cannot be the case that any true philosophy, that any genuine philosophical reasoning could lead to a conclusion that was inconsistent with the faith. I think the individual Christian believer, the individual theologian, right, um, is going to be someone for whom the apparent paths of philosophy that lead away from the faith are not paths that one, not paths that one should follow, right? One should recognize, right, something has gone awry, right? Mm -hmm. um, but as soon as, I, I mean, I'll just say, as soon as I, as a, you know, a, a person trained in philosophy say that as a Catholic, right, there are non, you know, uh, non-Catholic, non-believing philosophers who would have a concern about whether I'm genuinely a philosopher or not. Um, and I think that's a, um, uh, mm. it's a, it's a difficult question. Um, and one that has to be, to be thought through. Now, the question is asked if it's about practical advice as a Christian believer, right? Mm. Then what I would say is just this, to the extent that philosophical reasoning, um, philosophical arguments would seem to lead one to conclusions that are inconsistent with, right, with faith, um, one should attempt to bracket and assume that what's going on is that one does not yet fully understand, right? Um, and that one needs to, um, to think through the issues, right? And, and, um, and also consult others and try to find a good response. And this is what's so important about Thomas's account of the role of philosophy within the work of theology. The theologian is one who must use good philosophical arguments in responding to the errors put forward by some as, as philosophical arguments. Right. I hope that helps. I mean, that, that is, as, as Rob said, that's a very big, big question. Yes, thank you. Um, there, there's a couple more questions along those lines, but I, I think right now we might move to a, a slightly different subject. Um, there, we have a question more about God's perfection and eminence as creator over creation. Uh, Shay asks, about, I think, the, the triplex way and the, and the three ways of, of, of uh, God's transcendence. Uh, uh, Shay asked, does God's perfection transcends creatures because of the fall, that is original sin? Would perfect attributes in creatures be evident without the fall? Yeah, very good. So on the one hand, we do want to say that 
um, especially in the case of the human being. Now, this is a theological right claim for Thomas, right? There are um, perfections of human nature that were present before the fall that are no longer present after the fall. And I did say that Thomas thinks that before the fall, Adam and Eve would have been capable in knowing creatures, in knowing the being and the goodness and the, you know, the beauty of creatures, to have just seen God as in a mirror, clearly, in the perfections of created things. Um, but God would infinitely exceed the perfection of any created thing, right, with or without the fall. God is infinite. Every creature with or without the fall, right, is finite and limited. And so if what you mean by, you know, perfect, like unlimited perfections, or if, if what you mean is perfections that would somehow be, you know, equal to, or right, really commensurate with the divine perfection, would there have been any such perfections in creation before the fall? Thomas's answer would, would definitely be no. Hmm. Okay. But there would have been a different way of knowing through the perfections in things. Thomas thinks Adam and Eve didn't, need to engage in philosophical reasoning in order to know God through his effects, mm -hmm. where we have to do the hard work of, uh, of reasoning, um, of reasoning from creative effects. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No, that's, that's really helpful. I, I was thinking about these three ways and you gave us a really nice, a really nice uh, presentation of, of the three ways, especially uh, uh, from Dionysius. But I wondered if, if, if you would lead us through maybe some examples of some of these. So for example, maybe the way of negation or removal might would that have something to do with the what what, what scripture says about a god calling maybe god the lion of judah something like that mm, okay and you would you would maybe remove some things how how, how would that how would, how does that make sense to call god the lion of judah okay good so uh pseudo dionysius is the the thinker to appeal to um to answer that that part of the question right um the divine names from which St. Thomas takes that threefold way of causality, negation, and eminence concerns um, what Dionysius calls the intelligible processions of God. And those are the sorts of perfections that I keep mentioning over and over again, things like being and goodness and wisdom and power and so mm -hmm. on. Um, Pseudo Dionysius claims uh, in the beginning of On the Divine Names that he wrote a whole other treatise on um, the names of God that are um, metaphorical mm -hmm. in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And so um, whether that work was ever actually written or not, and whether we have access to it, Pseudo Dionysius claims to have written, um, uh, claims to have written this other work on the metaphorical names of God. So a name like lion, right? Thomas is gonna say that a name like that, because it's referring to a sensible created thing as a material, as a certain kind of material thing, that sort of name can only ever be said metaphorically of God, right? But that it's certain perfections within creatures, things like being and goodness and wisdom and so on, right? That can be said properly of God, right? That can enter into our, our understanding of the divine nature, albeit again in this very, very imperfect and limited way. I hope that helps. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very, so that's helpful. Okay. And then, uh, sort of along those lines as well. Um, yeah, Brian asked a, a, a more a little bit about this triplex way, right? This this way of negation and how does one know what to strip away? And so you're sort of asking answering this question already. I'll read his question. In the the threefold way, the triplex way, the way of negation is to deny features of God and the apophatic process. How do we know what things to deny of God? without first having a positive conception of God that allows us to distinguish which things to apply analogously yeah. and what things we should deny. Yeah, okay, very good. That's also, that's a tough one. That's a- you know, Yeah, no, it's, but it's a, it's a fantastic question. And um, the, Maybe the shortest way to answer, I'll, first I'll just say what Saint, when St. Saint Thomas himself says, what are the things that are always to be stripped away by the negative way? Anything pertaining to materiality, okay? And anything that in its very notion involves some limitation or defect. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Now it is important, I think, that Thomas does use the negative way as, as sort of a negative sieve for removing things from our understanding of right from our understanding of God. Um, we cannot in any way affirm Thomas thinks properly of God, anything involving materiality, anything involving any sort of limitation or defect. So for example, you cannot call, you can't say that there is evil in God just because in the very notion of evil, right? There's, there's imperfection. Okay. There's defect. You cannot say that God is a body or that God is a stone or that God is a lion because just in the very notion of those things matter is included. So when Thomas himself is explicit about what do we always eliminate through the negative way, he names right matter and, and, and defect. Hmm. The other thing to say, though, when it comes to the negative way is to remember is to also acknowledge that in a certain respect, all things are stripped away, right, um, from God through the negative way, even the things that are affirmed positively about God, like God's being wise or God's being good. It's always accompanied by this qualification that I'm not attributing these things as they're found in creatures, right, to God. I'm not saying that he's univocally good or univocally wise in the way that creatures are good or wise. Um, now, the question what things do or don't get stripped away by, um, by the negative way, um, this does become a major problem point of theological contention in the decades after um, after St. Thomas. So it is a big problem. It is a big question. I don't want to be dismissive of the question, but at least as far as what St. Thomas says about which things are always um, removed from God, matter and defect. So because God is absolutely simple and because God is understood to be absolutely perfect, there was one thing that the questioner said that just came to mind that I should should mention and affirm the idea that you could only strip things away negatively on the basis of some kind of positive or affirmative knowledge. The notion that negations are always founded on some kind of positive grasp. And that certainly is right. Okay, but the positive grasp that we have of God philosophically, first and foremost, is just the knowledge of a first uncaused transcendent cause. Mm -hmm. You can quickly reason that such a cause must be absolutely simple and must be absolutely mm -hmm. perfect. And then you have the basis for removing anything that bespeaks materiality because of God's simplicity and anything that would suggest any kind of defect or, or imperfection in God because of his perfection. Hmm. Thank you. Now, I think this is, uh, it's, it's probing now into the heart of some of the things that the past uh, presentation have worked out. Basically, the, the relationship of our thinking to our reading of scripture, right? How do these things, like God is the Lion of Judah, God is uh, um, a very, you know, all the images that scripture gives us, plus these really difficult dialectical, uh, uh, dis well, let's say discursive chains that, that Thomas works out. And uh, we, we've had a couple questions on, on these type of things, sort of the, the background, the sort of the contemplative uh, a background of, of Thomas's thought, as well as his own experience with scripture. Uh, Stephen uh, Calm asks about uh, Thomas's mystical uh, side of things. He, he writes, do you know of Thomas having any prayer experiences that might be called mystical? Do you have any thoughts about how these experiences uh, or, or lack thereof, if, if, it, if likely or if possible, uh, influence Thomas's arguments for how we can know God? Oh, very good. Uh, so the short answer first is yes, is that in our um, knowledge of Thomas's biography, uh, there um, he, he was widely and quickly regarded as um, a saint. Um, and as someone who did have um, tremendously intimate uh, experiences in his prayer, um, most famously, I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk that Thomas's uh, Summa Theologiae was left unfinished. And uh, St. Thomas is said when he um, was coming closer to the end of his life um, that he had some sort of mystical experience and mm -hmm. stopped writing, stopped producing um, any of his theological writing. And this is like, you know, turning off the, you know, the fire hose. I mean, the, the level of productivity that he had had in his final years up to that point was just tremendous. 
Um, so in the midst of his writing of the third part of the Summa, the treatise on the sacraments, uh, the work on the part of the treatise on uh, penance, on the sacrament of penance, uh, Thomas had some kind of mystical experience. And when asked by his assistant, you know, if he was going to resume the work of, of finishing the Summa Theologiae, he's reported to have said that in comparison to what I have seen, everything I have written is as straw. Now, sometimes this is taken to be, you know, Thomas's rejection of the, you know, the goodness or the value of, of what he had done with his life's work, right, in the writing of, of theology. But I think given what we've said tonight about the placement of philosophical wisdom and the work of faith and theology within the hierarchy, right, of the ways of coming to know God, Thomas is a person for whom his entire life was ordered towards the hope of the beatific vision. Hmm. I mean, it seems he did have some experience towards the end of his life, a sort of foretaste of, uh, of seeing God um, that did lead him to, to set aside, um, to set aside his work. Now, Thomas on his deathbed at Fosanova was, um, we're told, um, asked by the monks there to compose a commentary or to deliver some sort of teaching on the song of songs. Um, unfortunately, the, whatever work he produced, uh, did not survive. It wasn't, it wasn't either wasn't written down or wasn't copied and so hasn't come down to us, but that's from very early biographies, a, a, an assertion that even at the end of his life, he was producing some, some commentary on scripture, um, and on a particularly, uh, fitting part of scripture, the song of songs. Mm. Yeah. And a very mystical one as, as later presentations will, will, will start touching on in this series. On this same line, uh, there's a question on the, the, the a couple follow-ups on on this idea of the beatific vision, which we saw was the some of the gracious ways, the ways by grace of of coming to know God alongside the gift of the Holy Spirit, alongside infused faith. Uh, we we have two questions. I'm going to ask them side by side because they're they're related to this. Uh, one, just a clarification on, uh, Mark asks for a clarification on the beatific knowledge and the way it relates to Christ, the saints, and the laity. Mm -hmm. And a second one uh, by Jacob, how does the role of deification or divinization play into the knowledge of God? In other words, what does becoming like God have to do with Thomas's understanding and knowing of God? I, th I thought that that might fit well with the be beatific under, uh, under, uh, discussion there. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Go for it. Well, I wanted to ask the, the first question. You said he was asking for clarification about um, the beatific vision, mm -hmm. Christ's possession of the beatific vision, the saints. I just, I wasn't sure what the... Well, I think, well, maybe, maybe just um, a clarification of Thomas's concept of, of the beatific vision and then, and then... Um, yeah, because there's a whole lot to 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 relate it to, to Christ, the saints, and to laity all at once. But maybe we could do that, answer that question by answering the question of deification, perhaps. Okay, sure. So um, first, I mean, the, the thing to say about uh, the beatific vision itself, what does it mean, right? It is immediate intellectual union with God himself. Hmm. The holding of God as he is in himself with nothing mediating. Now, if um, anyone is already familiar with how, some of how Thomas thinks about human intellectual cognition, Thomas thinks that we know the essences of things through forms that our mind abstracts from sense experience. And so in talking about the beatific vision, Thomas has to say that God is what is known and is the very form or species by which he will be known. There can't be anything that mediates uh, that mediates the vision of God. We will be elevated so as to be drawn into this intimate, immediate union with God himself, um, but particularly in our intellectual capacity and in our minds. So that's what the beatific vision itself is. And as I was saying in the talk, Thomas thinks that um, Christ, as man, in his human nature, possessed the beatific vision throughout his earthly life. Um, other, apart from Christ enjoying the beatific vision in this life, Thomas thinks it's only after our death, right, um, that, uh, that human beings can enter into, right, enjoyment of the, uh, of the beatific vision. 
On the, the point about deification, um, there has been, um, I hear I, I, you know, maybe we'll say just being more of a philosopher than a theologian. I haven't myself spent as much time with um, deification as a theme, but there has been quite a bit of attention given to it um, recently in literature. Mm -hmm. And even just searching for, um, you know, Aquinas deification, um, there is some very good recent literature on the theme that's out there. Um, so I would just, I would have to suggest that the, the person asking the question, I can take a just stab at it, right, by saying that um, in the inner life of God, Thomas, along with other right, theologians, understand, understands the procession of the divine word in terms of God's self-knowledge. Right? So that the very inner life of God, the triune life of God, is established, grounded, as it were, first in right, God's self-knowledge. And so if the beatific vision is a direct and immediate knowing of the divine essence, right? This is um, attaining to and participating in the inner life of God. Um, and maybe that's that's a first stab at saying why deification is involved in the, in the beatific vision. Hmm. Thank you. There's there's more questions than we can really get to today, uh, which is great. And there's uh, there's I have several of my own that we just won't have a chance to 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 cover. Uh, regarding uh, uh, a follow-up from uh, another of our of our uh, speakers regarding Thomas's mystical experiences, to press that into his some of his practice, uh, one of our our readers asks. I recall reading that Thomas said most of his insights came from or after much study, while he was in adoration. Uh, how did that or did that inform his work? Did Thomas spend a life of prayer? What was his what, what, how did that? How did his prayer life uh, fit within his commenting on philosophical texts, his preaching, and, and so forth? Yeah. So, uh, from my understanding, what we know from the uh, biography of Saint Thomas um, includes both the claims that he was um, extremely prayerful, spent much time in prayer, especially prayer before the Blessed Sacrament, prayer before the crucifix. Um, but we also know that given his theological output, given all of the work that he did as a theologian, we know that he was given permission um, to be excused from the singing of the office with his Dominican uh, brethren. Um, so he wasn't required to go. So what we're told is that he would typically go to the chapel often on his own or just with um, his assistant, Reginald, and would spend time right in the chapel, right? Um, with the Blessed Sacrament before the crucifix. There are some significant moments in Thomas's life where um, he attributed insights that he had in his, the in his theology to experiences in, in prayer. And so, you know, I've, I've associated the work of theology, especially with faith, but I think in Thomas's own experience, right, um, it, he personally attributes um, many of his own theological insights to um, time spent in prayer. Um, and most uh, famously, um, it said that when Thomas had finished composing uh, the section of the Summa Theologiae on the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist, that uh, he went before the crucifix in prayer and had a vision in which, well, he had a conversation with the Lord in which he asked whether he had done well he hoped that he had done well mm. i think as the story is told even sort of put the writings right before right before the lord and asked if uh, if he had done well and uh he has a sort of vision in which uh christ tells him you have done well and what would you what would you wish to have mm. and, uh, thomas's answer famously is uh only you mm. as, as his answer so yeah part of the yeah biography of thomas as a as a saint and theologian um is someone whose whose work as a theologian is grounded in um a life of prayer yeah and, and i think picking up on this line uh I, I think one of our our uh the one of the questions from our attendees is pressing you on the, the fact uh, speaking as a philosopher uh on on whether or not thomas should be really understood as a philosopher or a theologian and if it's useful to think of it in that way, he asks, or they ask, are the debates whether Aquinas was primarily a theologian or a philosopher, are they helpful 
Or do they create a false dichotomy of a multicolored tapestry of a man who cannot be broken down into such binary ways? Yeah, good. So this is a very good uh, question and an important one. And um, I think it is a helpful question to ask, right? But to ask in order to pose the question, well, what's the difference between philosophy and theology, right? What's the difference between ways of reasoning that appeal only to naturally known principles and ways of reasoning that appeal to things known by revelation and faith? So we need that distinction. Um, so if someone poses the question about whether Aquinas or some other figure was a theologian or a philosopher, and it helps to think through the difference between philosophy and theology, then, then it's a helpful question. Um, but I, I do think in a certain way, it's also, it, when in thinking about someone like Thomas himself, it is something of a false dichotomy. But it's a false dichotomy because of his understanding of theology. Mm -hmm. Theology is philosophical. Um, mm -hmm. His view. There are certain things that the theologian, the one pursuing a science of sacred teaching, soccer doctrina, uh, there's things that the, the theologian does that require the use of and the engagement with um, philosophical reasoning and philosophical uh, principles. Mm. So it, I think it, 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 in terms of Thomas's own view about what theology is and what it is supposed to do, um, it is a false dichotomy because on Thomas's view, every theologian should be a philosopher. Um, now, he doesn't ever call himself a philosopher, right? Mm. It's better to say that the theology, every theologian must be able to do philosophy. It would, would be the better way to put it. Mm. Maybe the less uh, controversial way to put it. Yeah, yeah. No, that's tremendous. Yeah, we will have Bernard coming up uh, in a little, little while who, who, who might be giving us a perspective that is Bernard of Clairvaux that would push back a little bit. And also uh, uh, Kevin Hughes on, on Bonaventure, who I should have mentioned earlier. Uh, we have another question from a little bit, the, a little bit on the other side uh, uh, about Tom, Thomism or Thomas and modern philosophy. Uh, one of our attendees asked, can, Tom, can Thomism or Thomas learn anything from modern philosophy? For example, a correction to Thomas's understanding of metaphysics or epistemology, or do you, do you take the foundations of modern uh, philosophical thinking to be too embedded with uh, principles hostile to the faith? Okay, very good. So this is also um, a very big, you know, sort of sweeping historical, you know, question about, um, you know, all of modern philosophy and, and Thomas. So, um, uh, I, I suppose I should just say that um, Thomas himself would have, and anyone who claims to be a follower of Thomas should have the same attitude towards philosophical sources of the later centuries as one has towards philosophical sources from, uh, from the ancient world. Um, that is, um, one has to be open to and able to think through and to reason with um, what one finds in philosophical authors. Um, so just speaking for myself, um, uh, yes, I do think that there are various uh, points where um, whether modern philosophy or modern science, where there are positions that we should adopt in distinction to points held by St. Thomas. Um, I do think that there are such cases. Um, but I think what St. Thomas teaches us in any case is the right way to engage with philosophical interlocutors, um, where one tries to understand one's interlocutor on his own terms and tries to account for the truth in what is being said by the interlocutor right, rather than um, only, right, dismissing and denying, right, what one's, uh, what one's interlocutor is, is asserting. Um, now, I'm not, I mean, I am not, generally speaking, any fan of early modern philosophy. I don't want to give the impression that I am, but just as a matter of methodology, um, I, yeah, I think that one has to answer philosophical arguments philosophically, and, um, and there are points concerning which we know that Thomas was um, was not correct, especially in his natural philosophy, his cosmology, some aspects of his understanding of human nature. Um, 
and to a certain extent also in some of the details, some of the details of, of, of his metaphysics insofar as those are grounded in certain claims about, um, about human nature or about the physical world. So yeah, there are absolutely, there are things that have to be corrected and updated um, in Thomas's own thought for anyone calling themselves a Thomist. Well, great. I think that <clears throat> brings us to an excellent place to close tonight um, with the humility that uh, we know that we, we each should have as we're approaching text, as we're approaching truth, and that we know that um, Thomas himself engendered um, in his own work. Um, I want to thank Rob for helping to moderate tonight's discussion and to for organizing this series. And I also want to thank Brian for bringing us this robust uh, discussion. And I want to thank you all for, for joining us. And I especially want to thank our co-sponsoring institutes. Um, just a reminder that we have two events coming up next week. Um, how might Aquinas, for example, bear on our own contemporary crisis? Join us for a dialogue with Stephen Meredith and Jeff Bishop on disease and the problem of evil. Also, I highly encourage you to tune in again next week, Thursday um, at 7 p.m. with Barbara Newman. Um, as I mentioned, a real giant um, in the field of medieval studies um, for Electron Hildegard of Bingham. Um, otherwise, uh, I would invite you all, if you want to support our work uh, making these series possible, you can donate at www.lumenchristi.org slash donate. You can find more details about all of our programs there. Um, thank you again, Brian. Thank you, Rob. Um, and I uh, look forward to um, welcoming all of our viewing audience here next week. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. That was great. Thanks, Rob. Great presentation. Yeah.